Hi everyone, I'm Natalie. And I'm Karen, and welcome to The Next Page, the podcast of the UN Library and Archives, Geneva. So today we welcome to the podcast, Professor Carlos Lopez, who actually joined us on the podcast back in 2019 in person to discuss his book, Africa in Transformation, Economic Development in the Age of Doubt. And you can go ahead and find that episode in our archives if you're interested to listen. Yes, that's right. And actually, Professor Carlos Lopez is a professor at the Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of Cape Town, a visiting professor at Sciences Po an associate fellow in the Africa program at Chatham House, and the former executive director of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, among other roles. Incredible. (laughs) Yes. And he joins us this time online from South Africa to speak about his latest book entitled Structural Change in Africa. It's definitely a rich book, and it looks at the idea of structural change through seven chapters. Now, does he walk us through the book and why it's important? Yes, this conversation definitely encapsulates the book, and Francesco and Professor Carlos Lopez really cover a lot. But one thing that really stuck out to me was his insights into investing in Africa's youth. And if you listen, you'll hear more about this. And it really was such an eye-opening conversation that really challenged as well my own perceptions. And so I really encourage everyone to take a listen. So here we go. Welcome, everyone, to this new episode of The Next Page, our podcast here at UN Library and Archives Geneva. Today, we're going to talk about a book recently published by Professor Carlos Lopez and his colleague George Cararac about structural change in Africa. Those of you who follow us since the beginning of this podcast may recall that Professor Lopez was actually our very first guest in episode one. And today he's back with us. Welcome back to the Library and Archives. Welcome back to our next page. Professor Lopez, how have you been? How are things in Africa amidst this pandemic crisis? Well, we we are curtailed in our mobility and we have a lot of uh, characteristics of our daily lives that have changed dramatically. That is true for Africa as it is for the rest of the world. I would say that Africa suffered a bit uh, less from a sanitary point of view, a bit more from an economic point of view. The socioeconomic impact remains the same, so things are not really back to normal. And I doubt they will be ever the same normal. Uh, We have to prepare for a different world. Don't we all? Well, today we're going to dive into your latest publication. You are known the world over for your expertise and insights about Africa, the economy in Africa, the society, politics. You are a big expert in these matters. And we're going to present to our audience your book, and its findings. So let's start with the overall presentation of the book Structural Change in Africa. I was impressed uh, when I went over the internet about this book and and I saw the Ngozi Okonyo Iweala, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nigeria, among many other things currently, said about your book, and I'm quoting, this book is different and therefore a must read. It presents a rich and refreshing perspective on Africa's need for structural transformation. It is Africans who must act to change mindsets. So how is this book different? Can you guide us through the contents? Well, it's different in the sense that uh, it tries to demonstrate that uh, until now, a lot of debates about Africa were about opportunities that the country X or country Y offers, or even the continent offers, Uh, from uh, an externalities point of view, meaning how good it is for business, how good it is to return for investment, how we can actually consider that the demographic curve that Africa is living right now could be used to uh, basically take advantage 
of what is called the demographic dividend. What I try, uh, together with uh, George, in this book to do is the opposite, is to say what is necessary for Africans to change their reality. And uh, their reality is basically a colonial model of commodity dependency. And we have to turn this around. And to turn this around, we need to do structural transformation. We define it in terms of industrialization. And we are saying this industrialization comes at an age where the world is no longer the same. So intellectual property rights have become quite skewed. The trade regimes have become very complex. Protectionism is no longer available the way it was when others industrialize. The global value chains have taken over. So it's very difficult to produce anything from A to Z in the same place. We depend much more on supply chains. Logistics have become extremely complex and part of the content. But more importantly, the software side of the production system, from design to intellectual property and all the rest, has become the most valuable part of any production in the industrial era. So therefore, the latecomers, like most African countries, that want to get into structural transformation through industrialization are going to face enormous difficulties just in terms of the global environment. Now, you add to this the ecosystem difficulties, like uh, lack of skills, uh, infrastructure that is very poor, uh, access to capital that is very difficult, and you may end up, you know, very pessimistic. So what this book basically tries to demonstrate is that the agency of the Africans can turn all these challenges around and can propose uh, ways out of each one of these dilemmas. When we look at the transformation through industrialization part of your argument, and I know that you've touched on this subject in many other studies and articles, and actually I remember you advocating for this when you were here, our guest, in the, in the library in person a couple of years ago. But it may seem counterintuitive to many uh, when they think about Africa, that the future of Africa is industrial, considering the ecological and environmental fragilities of the continent and the preciousness of its, uh, of its environment. So why is the transformation of Africa linked to its industrialization? And what type of industrialization are you anticipating for the continent? I'm a strong advocate of uh, making sure that we protect our environment and planet, I'm a strong advocate of taking cognizance of climate change and uh, very much involved in climate action, be it uh, in the urban area that Africa is going to face uh, with uh, strong urbanization efforts everywhere, but also in terms of just protecting our pristine areas uh, that we need to conserve. Now, this being said, industrialization can be done in a way that economy and climate go hand in hand. It is possible to do it because today we have the technological expertise to do a green industrialization. What does that mean in African terms? It basically means taking advantage most and foremost of the fact that renewable energies now have production costs that are matching and sometimes surpassing in terms of a good return the investments on fossil fuels. So you can uh, be extremely active in actually making the matrix of the energy sector dependent on renewables rather than fossil fuels. Then you have also the advantage of most infrastructure now being built could profit from sustainable materials and sustainable forms of building infrastructure. So if you take these two together, infrastructure and energy in particular, you are going to have almost 80% of what contributes to a very polluted type of industry. Now, it also depends on what kind of value chains you are going to enter. And what we are saying is that Africa, because it's an exporter of commodities, most of them exported raw If it transforms it in Africa itself, you save the planet from the shipping industry going, you know, across the globe with our products, uh, non-transformed. 
And uh, what happens is that the maritime industry is actually the second or third largest polluter, depending on how you count. And this is, of course, unsustainable over the long run. And we have seen with the pandemic how also risky it is as a business to depend very much on supply chains and value chains that are focusing on one geographical area, in this case, Southeast Asia and China in particular. So all of this contributes to reducing emissions and contributes to creating jobs in Africa. So you have the characteristics, I just mentioned a few, that make this type of industrialization very different from what was done before. And of course, the the type of cities that we are going to build also will have to take into account climate change. Now, what we have uh, currently in Africa is like an urban sprawl. It's it's a very difficult way of, you know, basically making services available because you have a a large tract of land that are occupied by semi-rural, semi-urban dwellers. So you, you, don't, you don't have a definition that is very clear because it's completely hybrid. Now, we have to change that, and we have to change that with massive transports. And the transportation systems are going to be the key ingredient for basically providing better services, uh, creating opportunities for people to get out of poverty, and integrating themselves in uh, economic structures of cities. But also, that is the fundamental element that allows for uh, industrialization uh, that is greener, that is uh, uh, capable of basically creating opportunities for import substitution of some sorts, very uh, vibrant agro-industry that is necessary to feed people because Africa is going to have the largest uh, increase in population of all regions. And of course, all of that, you know, uh, can be made sustainable. Chapter six of your book carries the title Selected Experiences, Drilling into the Country Dimension. Can you tell us about one or two experiences that are worth sharing here with our audience? What we try to do in the book is to, you know, not just to take the debate from a sort of a stratospheric level or continental level and drill into realities that are quite different one from another that demonstrate the variety of Africa, but also how there are some commonalities. And those commonalities are the ones that we are sort of appealing should be part of the structural transformation uh, drive. Uh, We take, for instance, a case like Tunisia, that is a country that has demonstrated excellent development indicators. But then we say, you know, it has had a lot of problems of uh, governance of late. And we try to demonstrate that part of these problems have also spilled over in the way they have dealt with some of the economic decisions. And uh, they have uh, taken some good turns, but also some bad turns. Then we go into a country like Cameroon, that is a fabulous country in terms of resources. And we say this is a very good example of a country that is constantly being in the wait in terms of its uh, turnaround. And uh, we try to uh, you know, basically go through the industrialization potential of a country like Cameroon and why the absence of robust diversification policies has affected its development. Then we take a country like Cape Verde to get, to get the example of a small island state and how well they have done in terms of you know, taking advantage of uh, very limited resources, uh, support from development uh, aid agencies that was very well governed, very well managed, that eventually got the the, the country to graduate to middle-income status. Or countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia that have been quite astounding in terms of introducing industrialization into their economic structure. Uh, Rwanda, we highlight the importance of staying the course, how determination has really been uh, the number one element how the leadership has counted for some of the increases in the indicators that they got over the last years. And Ethiopia, it's very interesting also because it's the archetype of a modern Africa developmental state with all its difficulties, with all its characteristics that you know we know today uh, are fragile, like the ethnic divisions of the country, but also how it is possible to have some national champions. One good example is Ethiopian Airlines that now 
basically dominates the airline industry in, in the continent. But you can also say the same in terms of how Ethiopia has progressed on, with a soft commodity like uh, flowers or coffee or with the uh, textiles production that has increased significantly over the last few years to the point that now they are selling to the top brands of First Street. Going back to what you were saying just before, Professor, about this drive for industrialization, how it affects and needs to be synchronized with the environmental sector, for example, the, the services sector, the transportation you mentioned. I was wondering, what is the most common cause of applying brakes on this, on this drive for change? What is that is keeping, holding this process of transformation that could visibly, according to what you argue in your book and in other studies you have written, go faster? I think we have now a typology of uh, regimes in Africa that can be simplified in just two categories. You have the rent seekers and the rent seeking behavior on one hand, and you have the transformers or the transformative leadership on the other hand. And if you, if you look into the countries of the continent, you can easily identify those who are in one category or the other. Now, why do I simplify this typology? I simplify it because it gives us an opportunity for us to basically bring the debate internally on transformation and not just be content with criticizing the systemic difficulties that the continent faces. Because we do have systemic problems to solve. On the financial side, we have systemic issues that are now translating in the way we are dealing with debt. Sovereign debt is a world problem, but it is normally specified as if it was an issue in Africa. We can have also systemic issues mentioned in many other areas, like, for instance, the behavior of the rating agencies that influences how macroeconomic dimensions are managed in the continent, uh, how the currency regimes are affecting Africa, and so on and so forth. So we have many systemic issues. But if we just try to concentrate our small energy, relative energy, into the systemic issues, probably you are not going to advance much. We have to start from within. And the countries that are transformers, they try to identify opportunities within the domestic limitations. And they have proven that it is possible to do a lot of change just in advantage of those domestic opportunities. For instance, on the financing, you can criticize a lot that you don't have access to capital, which is true. African countries are the least financed globally. But you can also look into your pension funds and see how they are managed, and probably they are not properly managed, and there is a lot of unproductive capital that is sitting there. So if proper investments were done, that was a source of financing that is right next to you that is overlooked by most African leaders. So there are examples like that, and the book is trying to focus on the agency, the things that the Africans can do themselves. And when it comes to the international side, how much they have to unify their voice to be listened to. For instance, on trade, now there is a free trade area. For Africa, if we present ourselves for trade negotiations as one, it's quite important in size and also in geopolitical influence. But if, you know, we are dispersed and atomized, of course we are very fragile. We are not going to have an impact. Thank you so much. That is so uh, so clear, so powerful. And it's a perfect segue, actually, to the next part I wanted to take this conversation to, which is leadership in Africa. So I was impressed with what Alan Hirsch said. Alan Hirsch for our audience is the professor and director at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance where you teach as well. And he says that this is the first book he will place in the hands of emerging African leaders. And another reviewer actually uh, notes that you and Karorak authored a new narrative to support a transformative agenda underpinned by African agency. So I wanted to ask you to tell us about this generation of emerging African leaders and what we can expect from their impact on the continent and the world. 
Well, I think it's very important for people to realize that one in every two babies by the year 2060 are going to be African. So this is going to be a very powerful global public good, the youthness of Africa. Why do I say this? Because, you know, we have an international debate about sustainable development goals that is based on the principle philosophically that we should cater for the next generation. And the next generation, for a large extent, is going to be dominated by young Africans. So if you are calling for this solidarity, you have to identify also what these young Africans are going to do for the world. So they become a global public good. You have to invest on them because they are going to represent, just from a very selfish point of view, for those who are in rich countries, the consumer market of the future. So you you need to have them as consumers because new technologies are not going to be very easy to absorb by 60 years old, like myself, even less by 80 years old, and so on and so forth. This is going to be a world where the concept of digital natives, whether we like it or not, is going to be more and more digital natives Africans because uh, they are going to be the largest proportion of young people. As we are right now, we can uh, already see the consequences and the impact of this demographic transition that the world is living. Because, you know, a pandemic has affected different regions differently, not because of the quality of their health systems, but partly because of their capacity to respond quickly, that's one, and second, because of the composition of age of their population. The younger the population, the less affected. So this is going to be a bit the new normal. And I think it is very important for us to look into how we can create leadership amongst these young people in Africa that are going to have the world in mind, that are going to have the planet in mind, and that are going to be prepared to take responsibilities that are global. And I think this is an investment that is not only a responsibility for Africans, it's a responsibility for the world, because we are all going to benefit from it. And I think what the book tries to present is a demonstration that these young people have first to be instilled in a new narrative. They have to believe in the potential of Africa, not from sort of a dream world type of perspective, but because you put in their hands some instruments and tools that demonstrate that structural transformation is possible, but it's only possible if you have the right leadership qualities in charge, and it's only possible if we actually demonstrate such agency that we are proclaiming is absolutely fundamental. Well, a few very powerful things there, uh, Professor Lopez. And one of them is, if by 2060, one in every two babies is going to be born an African, that begs also the question of how is the rest of the world looking at Africa today? There is a gap of perception there. If we walk out of Africa and take a look at this emerging continent from a New European standpoint or a Western standpoint, how would you depict that gap? What, what is there that needs to be readdressed or fixed? The number one gap is the perception related. We need a, a narrative that is um, evidence-based. And a lot of people will say, well, there is a lot of evidence about Africa that is used in different assessments and reviews about the continent. We dispute that in the book. We say that there is almost like an unconventional, unwritten norm to treat Africa always down. One demonstration is geography. You know, there is a Mercator projection that puts Africa's size in the world map much smaller than it is. You know, it, it's comparable to Groenland because of that projection. When Groenland is 14 times less than Africa, and people who have difficulties admitting that Africa is as big as the West Africa, sorry, Western Europe, China, Japan, the US, and India combined. <laughs> combined. So it, it's very difficult for people to realize that. But then, you know, you, you fast forward and you see that Google Maps uses the same projection that was conceived based on the explorer's knowledge of the world 
Right now, we have the capacity and we even have a projection, the Peters projection, that corresponds to the territorial size of the different continents that could be used and disseminated. But even a most innovative and most uh, recent attempt to, you know, deal with the, 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 the knowledge base is actually transformed into the old because what the algorithms have to do in the Google Maps is actually to convert the real sizes into the Mercator projection people are used to. Isn't this fascinating that, you know, we keep insisting on the wrong because that's the way we portray and, and that's what people are used to see. We can say the same in the arts. We can say the same in philosophy. We can say the same in literature. So there is a, a beginning of a recognition that the contributions of Africans are much more important than they were. And Black Lives Matter has actually opened up the debate yet again. But we have these waves of, you know, sort of contestation. But then we go back to sort of the narrative that people are accustomed to. For instance, last week I was just again reading newspapers mentioning that the second or third wave of the pandemic is going to be devastating to Africa. That's what we heard for the first. You know, it, it's, it's, we go back to sort of a default mode about the way we treat Africa. I think that's the number one gap that we need to change. Thank you. Going back to what Alan Hirsch said about your book, he used the term immense imminent potential of African economic development. I like that, this concept of immense imminent. Um, and I would like to ask you, the economist you are, uh, can you give us and our listeners an idea of how imminent and how large is Africa's economic future, maybe also to put in perspective with Agenda 2063? Well, in fact, uh, the Agenda 2063 that was the attempt by the African Union to give ambition to the African agenda and to give ambition to our leaders to, you know, basically pursue a route that is different from the first 50 years of continental institutional arrangements, which was the OEU and the establishment of the African Union in 2002, is also, you know, dreamland if it is not transformed into a agenda for action. And uh, what uh, we are trying in this book is basically to give the elements of that agenda for action, which are based on the principle of structural transformation, but also with a focus that is very clear, industrialization. Now, what I think uh, makes it eminent is the fact that we are entering into a world where automation, robotization, artificial intelligence is going to completely change modes of production. And uh, it's going also to change logistics and it's going to change mobility with electric cars and all the rest. So what people talk less is that these new technologies do require, like others before, their specific type of minerals. You, know, you, you can't really have electric cars without batteries and the batteries require specific cobalt uh, leaks that, you know, are in the majority in Africa. You cannot really continue to develop the electronic industry without uh, access to coltan that is, you know, 80% in Africa. You, you need to, for the 3D printing, the special graphite that, you know, is mostly concentrated in Africa. You, you need for all these different um, new forms of uh, transportation, platinum league of minerals that are mostly concentrated in Africa. In short, Africa has a lot of strategic minerals. Are we going to have another wave of commodity dependence? Or are we going this time to use these various strategic minerals to propel Africa's transformation? That's basically what makes it eminent. If we don't get it right this time, it's going to be another wave that may last another 50 years. So that's, that's what is compelling. And yet there is, in my opinion, very little probability that it will last another 50 years. And that is because the relative role that Africa has already today 
in the way we want to solve global problems. So you spoke very clearly about this negative narrative that is embedded in some Western culture of talking Africa down, to use your term. And I, and I believe that is rather present, this kind of narrative that is embedded in the way we see, portray Africa in our own brains as Westerners. But that doesn't take anything away from the potential role that Africa is playing on the global scene, especially when we look at the feasibility of Agenda 2030, with or without Africa, there is a huge potential there, not only for economic development for, for Africa, but for presence on global stage. And I would venture to say that there's no solution to global problems without Africa. How do you see this, Professor? I see that, you know, we, we started with a social contract that was based in the principle that you go from solidarity within a family to solidarity within a community and then a nation. And then, you know, the, the, the national realities were to have a social contract within a nation or a country. Then, you know, with the European Union, ASEAN, uh, Mercosur, all these different arrangements, we moved into a regional dimension of this solidarity. And now we are approaching a stage because of the demographic dimensions where it's absolutely fundamental to have a global dimension of solidarity. And that is going to create a perception that, yes, like you said, Africa is very much part of the solution. And if we don't take that on board, there is no solution. Well, we are seeing it with the pandemic. We can have vaccines distributed all over the world and exclude Africa. The virus will not disappear. Uh, I think it is very important for us to not exclude Africa and to make it central because it's the last frontier of development. Until four years ago, you were the eighth executive director of the Economic Commission for Africa. I wanted to ask you about the UN role in accompanying this change of narrative. I think that is something that the UN has constantly tried to do uh, since the decolonization period, and maybe even earlier. But today, modern times, and projecting this forward, especially in the context, again, of Agenda 2030, is the UN a key actor? What is doing right? What should it do more? Of course, uh, because uh, the UN embodies the international community, as it is mentioned by all assessments, and it has an agenda that has been the subject of negotiations uh, amongst all countries. It is a fundamental player to bring this narrative about Africa on board. And I think efforts have been made and more needs to be made. But, you know, I can see a lot of change. Uh, but we have also to go to the very practical. And the very practical is, for instance, we have three layers of data and evidence that are essential to change the narrative of the continent. The first layer is up-to-date national accounts. We need to have economic data that is up-to-date. And we have a lot of countries in Africa that don't follow the latest developments methodologically in terms of national accounts. And therefore, what we know about the structure of the economies, the size of the economies, is all projections, is not based in reality. Each time that we do a rebasing exercise, which is to update these national accounts, we discover that we have missed about 20% of the economy. Then you have civil registration, which is about knowing people. And you have about 40% of Africans that don't have an ID, don't have a civil registration of any kind. And, and from the moment they, they are born until the moment they die, they have no single document. So, of course, that means you don't know your population, you don't know how to plan properly. And then finally, you have the territorial knowledge, which also translates into, you know, land tenure systems, registration uh, systems. And again, we have extremely poor tracking of the territorial dimensions of property in Africa. And therefore, if you don't know your territory, people and economy properly, you are going to be trapped into a narrative that is based on a lot of projections and a lot of cocktails of uh, information that are not really evidence-based. And this is a responsibility that each 
the agency of the UN can take care of because, you know, it's it's part of their expertise and it's part of the kind of things that the UN should prioritize. And I think uh, a lot of agencies are already aware of this. They have done efforts in this field, but we need just to make this much more prominent, much more important in terms of, uh, you know, focus and in terms of intention. And perhaps also beginning um, to move away from this narrative that Africa is the field, field missions, field deployment. Africa is the deep field, right? Staying practical, Professor Lopez, do you think that the, the COVID pandemic will damage Africa's cheetah run? <laughs> uh, that's very interesting because, you know, the metaphor of the cheetah that I like to use a lot is because cheetahs are the fastest and Africans have a lot of catch up to do. So they need the, the speed of the cheetah. They, they need to ail the cheetah that is African as, as a model. But there is another reason I like to mention the cheetahs. Well, there are many, but this one in particular is that cheetahs are agile, they are very fast, but they are ready to change direction very quickly. And what is interesting is that when they change direction to catch whatever they are after, they do it in a coordinated manner, in a team manner. So this is exactly what Africa needs, you know, <laughs> needs to be ready to be able to change direction quickly, but at the same time in a coordinated manner. But do you think that what's happening now in terms of uh, global transportation uh, restrictions, movement of goods and people because of COVID could signal a damage to the development, the transformation that Africa so badly requires now? Well, COVID, of course, is going to give us the first recession period uh, since uh, independence years. It has been already the case in 2020. We may have uh, about the same in 2021, although the projections right now are not for a necessarily a recession for 2021. I, I think they are over-optimistic. And I think it is very important for us to bear in mind that there are some lessons that are actually positive for the continent coming out of COVID. So we saw, for instance, that there was a lot of protectionism back in the countries that are rich. So they can no longer, from a philosophical point of view, but also a policy point of view, preach us to be completely against protection. Because when we insisted in Africa that we needed that type of liberty to deal with HIV AIDS, it was considered that this was not viable. Uh, then there was a door round of negotiations on trade that never were implemented because it was considered over ambitious. Now, when push comes to shove, the richest countries are demonstrating that they are ready to change the rules. <laughs> so we now can negotiate differently these things that were sort of in our objectives and aims, but not being able to materialize. And I think also it has demonstrated some resilience that we can use to build up uh, capacities in Africa, like in pharmaceutical industries, protective equipment, medical supplies, all these things uh, were sort of neglected. But for me, the number one lesson of COVID that I really like, if one can like something about COVID, is the fact that uh, the countries are obliged to introduce social grants and social schemes and protection floor that they never consider as a priority before. And they implemented them because of COVID. And now they cannot go back. It's something that is going to stay. So the poor have been not necessarily in a better situation than before the pandemic. On the contrary, but they have acquired the rights that are not possible to retrieve from them anymore. And this is going to make our recovery very different from what we had experienced before. And that goes to show that even a situation as intricate and, and unseen as COVID pandemic could be turned into an opportunity uh, in Africa, and especially for the, for the people of Africa. Professor Lopez, as we start wrapping up this episode, I wanted to ask you, do you have a final thoughts that you wish our audience to remember uh, based on your work and your personal commitment to Africa? 
I think it's very important for people to realize that uh, the Africa of today is very different from the Africa of the last century. I think we started the year 2000 in a different uh, mode, gains in all indicators, social, economic, etc., even governance, have been quite significant. And we are more and more dealing with internal problems in a way that makes particularly the young people much more apt and much more willing to take charge. And I think what we need to really think as the priority for the continent is giving the chance to the young people, giving the chance to the youth. Thank you for that. Before we close, Professor, where can people find more about your work and any advice you may have for our audience of web resources and other knowledge sources? I'm very active in the web uh, with different interviews, uh, op-eds. Uh, I have uh, social media presence, etc. But I think all of this comes together in one place, which is my website, www.africacheetah.run, which basically congregates all these different contributions in one place. Thank you so much, Professor Carlos Lopez. Thank you for being again with Library and Archives, again on our podcast. I wish you all the best for this uh, new year. It was my pleasure, Francesco.